good morning good afternoon good evening those who have joined ibipsa education webinar series 2009 i'm rajan ravel one of the ibipsa member and also a chair education committee i'm happy to receive all of you on this first webinar of the second series uh, we have planned about 12 episodes in 2009 and I'm very happy that our one of our thought leader, Debipsa, Joe Clark, has agreed to uh, open the webinar with uh, the one session on title Vision for Building Performance Simulation. I'm sure that quite a few of you would have come across Joe's work or must have seen his book, a pioneering work which he is doing in building energy performance simulation since probably about 35, 40 years. One of the first book which came out in 1985 on building performance simulation was by Joe. Uh, Joe is presently in the University of Pasclide, uh, UK, and he does uh, work out of University's Christside, but as I mentioned, He's one of the thought leader of Ibipsa. I welcome Joe to this webinar. Thank you for joining. This webinar would be about 35 to 40 minutes. After webinar, we will have a question and answer session. In between, if you have any question, please use chat panel and send me your question. I will moderate question and answer session at the end of the webinar. Before I hand it over to Joe, I want to request all those who have joined that please do visit Ibipsa website and join Ibipsa as a supporting member. We have a supporting member category by which we are we are subscribing to some of the work which Ibipsa is doing, and uh, by joining Ibipsa as a supporting member, you will be concretely supporting activities of Ibipsa. So I encourage all of you to become a supporting member of Ibipsa. With this opening words, I again invite Joe and uh, I invite him to present the webinar. Joe, over to you. Thank you very much, Rajan. Well, hello everyone and uh, welcome to this webinar. It's uh, a pleasure and a privilege uh, to um, uh, accept IBIPSA's offer to start off the season. Um, I take it at this stage you can uh, see my screen, if not complain to Rajan. It's a rather strange experience for me sitting in my office talking to myself uh, with no particular immediate feedback, but I'll do my best. In thinking about the future of building performance simulation, I've divided my thoughts into uh, five topics, which I'll brief briefly cover now. I'm going to start looking at the scope of applications in future. I'm going to briefly look at the theoretical extensions we may require. I'm going to look at the potentials for uh, quite uh, useful applications of the technology in the short and medium term. I'm going to briefly touch on some of the requirements for use in practice, and I'm going to finish with a, a, a concept of a new direction for building performance simulation, which I am here terming reality emulation. So I hope you take something from these fairly high level uh, presented five topics. All aspects I'm going to uh, cover today uh, either are being either exist or are being pursued at some level in various centers. So it's not just speculative futures I'm talking about. It's things that are being uh, thought about and pursued at various uh, uh, fantastic establishments around the world. There's no implication, however, that the issues I'm going to cover are trivial. It's going to be quite difficult if we wanted to bring these to, into existence. Uh, to collaborate to these ends. It's also not my intention today to either criticize or endorse any particular method or tool. That's not helpful at this stage. 
It's just about we, the community, looking together into what would be good potentials for our collective future. So with a lot of ground to cover, so let me get started. You'll see my screen there. So I was asked to talk about the vision for building performance simulation, and that's what I'll do. And I can't change my slide for some reason. I can now. I think because I've got this uh, pen, uh, I can't we can see your. Little. Yeah, we, I can see the first slide, which is scope. Yeah, yeah I, I think I, I might have to turn off the little pointer. I'll, I'll see when I change the slide in a moment. Okay, so I want to start with scope. And each of my topics, I have a little slide like this. Uh, all the slides will be available to you after the pre after today. So in each uh, topic, I've given a little statement on what the issue is I think we're addressing and how we might resolve it. So in terms of the scope, all over the world, there's this uh, clean energy transition is underway. And in many countries, that means uh, greening uh, the uh, electric power system. And there's been lots of good uh, progress in that regard. And now many uh, governments are turning to what will be done to the building sector particularly the electrification of heating, or, or perhaps cooling in some parts of the world, and um, uh, doing something about transport to move away from fossil fuels, electrification of transport. And that all requires uh, quite profound shifts in society, and at the same time requires us to start to, to think seriously about the match between demand and supply. And that's a really difficult issue. It's not a steady state calculation here or there, or just looking at quantities. It's a match, it's a dynamic concept. So the resolution to that from our um, uh, community's perspective would be to um, Im improve the functionality, widen the functionality of building performance simulation to accommodate a holistic view of energy systems, whether it's a single building with all the integrated energy systems or a community, or parts of a city, so different scales. So in this presentation, when I talk about this concept, I'm going to be using the phrase BPS plus. So it's building performance simulation, that fantastic thing we now have, but with some other things added to it, which allow us to move into this future cities concept uh, together as a community. Again, I'm having, I think I need to turn this off, excuse me. It's not happy with me. You need to give me a moment, folks. Yes, it has. Okay, uh, I hope you see my cursor. We can see your cursor. Can, can you see my cursor moving? Yes, Joe, we can see your cursor moving. Rajan? Yes, Joe, I can, can you see, see my your cursor, cursor moving. I can see your cursor moving, Joe. Rajan, can you hear me? I can hear you, Joe. Uh, I can see your cursor moving. Rajan? I can see your... Arjun, can you say that? I can see your cursor moving. But can you hear me? I can hear you. Okay, uh, yeah, my colleague tells me you. that you can all still. Okay, sorry, I was asking and I couldn't hear you. Right, okay, moving on then. I'm now moving to uh, look at how we, why and, and how we might expand the scope. So this slide really talks about the fact that there are so many agendas in relation to demand side energy re reduction. And this is just an arbitrary list of lots of projects that a group like mine get engaged with and groups all around the world and no doubt those who are listening in, looking at heat recovery or smart control or demand management as opposed to demand response or uh, putting a, a heat pumps in instead of gas boilers or looking at uh, integrated renewables or energy storage and, 
and now we've got the agenda coming up, uh, which is all about uh, electric vehicles and plug-in charging and so on, and how that might add storage into the domestic environment or commercial buildings. So this tells us all that uh, we're in for a difficult future in being able to select these technologies or even more appropriately, blends of these technologies. The issues are quite profoundly complex. And so we need to make sure our uh, simulation tools are fit for purpose and that all these kinds of technologies can be uh, uh, analyzed in different mixes and that we understand when we talk about the performance of mix A as opposed to mix B, that we can communicate to each other what we mean by that. I'll say more about this later. So we need virtual prototyping to support selection of blends. Equally, on the supply side, there are so many agendas. Um, fossil fuels are here to stay for probably our lifetimes. Um, we've got all our strategic renewables being rolled out. We've got present strategic renewables. We've got future strategic renewables that will come along. We've got uh, the big debate about you know, base load through nuclear. We've got all the urban integration of renewables. And we've got all the energy uh, storage agendas. And they somehow uh, need to be handled hand in hand with the load profiles. It's not a disparate thing. We can just say wind power gives us so many uh, gigajoules. It's about matching the output to the demand. And that's a totally dynamic concept. If you don't have a load, you cannot have a supply unless you store it. But even storage is very expensive. It's problematic in many ways. So we really need our dynamic models um, to help us to affect the, the link, both spatially and temporally, uh, between supply and demand. And all these technologies you can see on the screen before you, they all need to be treated in the same way that we would treat a building. There's heat and mass transfers, there's fluid dynamics, there's control systems. So for me, each of these technologies is no different um, in, in its solution to what we do already in the building side. So bringing it all together is key, at least for me and I know for many of my colleagues. Then, Underpinning that demand complexity and supply side uh, comp uh, complexity, there's many confounding agendas. People push things. So in my country, the, the government calls for the electrification of heat, which means we'll all be putting heat pumps in everywhere. And as you know, heat pumps, at least in the UK, have failed to deliver in the past for reasons we understand. Um, and do we want to make that mistake again? No. Um, then there's a the whole agenda about net zero energy or carbon. There's smart grid services being pursued all over the world and so on. You can see the things I've put down here. But these are confounding issues. The little one that says electric vehicle charging, that's a car park some hundred meters away from my office where the proposal is to put PV canopies to allow free charging of electric vehicles. And that has all sorts of complexities when you start looking at charging protocols, the stochasticity of charge requirement, the stochasticity of uh, PV operation. And all of these things are real projects which can be studied very well with uh, current BPS, but do need some modifications to move us forward. In the panel here, these are all the issues that we need to, uh, or all the quantities that we somehow have to uh, articulate when we defend schemes. We have to say, is it legislation compliant? We have to say, if it needs communication, say a smart grid, are the communications resilient enough? If it's a hybrid system, how do you size a hybrid system if you're using different technologies? Uh, and then people say, but whatever we do, we have to reduce fuel poverty, or we now need to watch air quality. So you can see the explosion in complexity. And this is, on the one hand, uh, a formidable challenge. And on the other hand, it's good news because it makes purposeful the research and development 
going forward. And I say to any young person who's logged into this webinar today, your future is so assured if you get involved in a constructive way and helping the whole community move forward in the regards I'm talking about today. So the merits of a BPS Plus on the left-hand side, it allows us to address all these issues somehow simultaneously. We can evaluate technical feasibility. We can take on board complexity. We can consider human comfort. I won't go down the whole list. We can uh, report things in terms of energy and carbon emissions or other emission streams. We can look at um, uh, the ability we can control it. Some things are not easy to control, although the idea is good. We can also look at operational resilience, so we can run the clock forward. We can perturb the system and make sure it's resilient under the kinds of influences we might have in the real world. Significantly, we can get the balance between energy aspects going forward, environmental impact aspects, human well-being aspects, and productivity. And these can all be quantified and held in some kind of trade-off balance. And that surely is the destiny of, of the technology we're addressing today. But there's also lots of uncertainties and risks out there, and they can be accommodated in various ways, as we shall see. And then if the legislation becomes ever more stringent, as is likely, then we have a tool that will allow us to give evidence of regulatory compliance, uh, having taken account of all the dynamics and so on. And the beauty of this is it encapsulates everything on the right-hand side, which are all the fundamental things that researchers are interested in, all the building physics, which has had uh, many, 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 many decades of very, very good uh, evolution, all the thermal fluids, which underpins a lot of the technologies that are needed to design complex engineering systems, uh, the heat and mass transfers that take place, that change and interact in different ways, uh, all the radiant heat exchanges. Maybe we're doing that from an energy perspective or from a visual impact perspective. We can start to put in our plant and our uh, all our systems, and they uh, deserve no less treatment than we give to the building side, a fully dynamic system. But we also have to these days take account of electrical power flow, which is no different from airflow. It's the same techniques that are used uh, in the mathematical level. So that needs to be there because you can't just say your output from a PV panel. It's got to be where does the power go? And does that impact on local power quality? Uh, you know, does it take us out with regulated voltage range? What happens to frequency control? These are all issues going forward that need to be in our codes. And so on down that list. So my little uh, strapline message at the bottom, there's many development targets for our young researchers. And I commend them all to you. Get stuck in, get involved. We need your help. But there's also my message to practitioners, the significant new business opportunities here to both deepen and widen the business service offering. And that's good for business. And as you'll see me say later, unless we get better academic uh, industrial uh, partnerships in future, I think we're in trouble. That's a list, uh, just to finish this little first topic. That's a list I just took it off the web the other day. It's Horizon 2020, the big European uh, research program, and it's the next uh, call coming out, societal challenge number three, clean, sure, and efficient energy for the year 2020. And I'm struck when I look down that uh, list that it's asking for all the things I've just said. So, you know, enabling big data for the assessment of operational buildings and uh, deploying uh, smarter renewables and getting uh, ICT-based solutions in place. And even at the bottom, they're calling for a European forum for energy modeling, um, integrating local energy systems, mitigating energy poverty. So uh, uh, better smart grids, uh, prosumers with, uh, with people interacting uh, for financial benefit, 
uh, with the energy supply systems. So my little uh, message here is that all this research portends uh, both the use, use of, of uh, performance simulation and also its further development. And there'll be a lot of money in these programs for the young researchers to go and make their careers. I only ask that they help to build towards the collective. We're too disparate now. Everybody's developing their own thing, trying to get a little edge with what they do, and it's so hard to have collective integration. It needn't be like that, but we need to keep streaming about this problem in order that we might move forward as a more collaborative collective. Okay, so that's my play for at the high level. Um, clearly, these are topics that could be discussed all day and we could go into the, the depth of each of the technologies and so on. But we need, BPS has a phenomenal opportunity to widen its scope and bring real benefit because we've had such progress in the technology. So I'm saying we move away just from building design to community design, future cities design, and we take all, we accommodate all the various uh, issues that that um, requires. Theoretically, if I move to topic two, there's the issue and the resolution I'm proposing. The issue is that building performance simulation, because we used to do uh, energy considerations or make energy considerations through fairly simplistic manual calculations. These calculations were then codified. So we had software tools that had the engineering uh, simplified methods. Then in various areas against user demand, uh, various uh, aspects of that problem were deepened. And so, you know, like fabric conduction became dynamic, but uh, airflow stayed at steady state. And, we still had prescriptive occupancy and um, uh, we deepened our climate coverage, but not necessarily microclimate. So it was all piecemeal evolution. And we've now ended up with uh, tools which are a mix of what I'm calling here simplified methods, ones that we understand and are in engineering manuals and so on, and true simulation constructs. Now, there's arguments to be had here where simplified techniques could be very useful. And I accept that and I respect those who research that area. But I'm not talking about that area today. I'm not dismissing it, but I'm not discussing it. I'm discussing how we can transform our current tools into true, true simulators. And if we don't, then when it comes to simulation, we're going to have inappropriate applications of the technology that stop us from being able to compare solutions because we can never understand the assumptions people have made when arriving at their performance information as opposed to some other team or individual or other D or case. So the resolution of this, it seems to me, is to be more respectful of these simplifications and be more content to declare that they are there my simulations are predicated on ideal control. I haven't simulated the control systems. So if you can design a very, very good control system, my results are true. Um, we need to find a way that when we present information, the tools themselves are able to say what parts of the problem have been simplified. Pending the future concerted effort that we need to have together to deepen the theoretical basis to support true simulation. And as I'll argue in a little minute, true simulation is not about predicting the future. It is not about that. It is about emulating reality to make sure the solution we're putting forward is operationally robust, not to predict something that's going to happen tomorrow, next week, next year. So let's go on a little journey with theory. My apologies to my uh, friends who are maybe listening and who've heard me rabbiting on about this before, but this is my, and many other people's, of course, view of what true simulation is. It is the respect of the integrity of an energy system from four very important viewpoints. 
I know of no energy system that's not fully dynamic. It's a stiff dynamic problem with time constants that vary from sub uh, minute, maybe even seconds level, up to many hours or days. And somehow we have to process that system whilst respecting its inherent dynamic uh, interactions. Significantly, and, and uh, many programs are, are quite happy to have dynamic treatment of many of the domains, but some of them are still simplified, and we can surely start to systematically uh, remove that in all our codes where we're talking about true simulation. That's not to say that any domain can't be simplified as long as that's declared to have been done. Going down to the, the lower one here, uh, the defining data are nonlinear. Now, this is the biggest issue we have in our community, I think, when we uh, make computer models and we linearize everything as a, some kind of convenience of use. All the data, as far as I can see, that describes a problem depends on the answer. So in that regard, it's a nonlinear problem. The material properties depend on the answer, the temperatures and humidities. The, the plant efficiencies depend on the state variables that the, the plant is manipulating. So if we linearize the input parameters, we must declare that to say that these results are only true if the insulation conductivity is a narrow range, it never gets wet, et cetera, et cetera, or whatever. Or it's only true if the control system keeps the COP of the heat pump within a very narrow band. Otherwise, you need to model the nonlinearity. The problem top here is systemic. It's got many, many, many different things interacting that affect people's health and well-being and energy utilization, environmental impact controllability, air quality, all these things interact. And we must find ways of saying, when we do an analysis, what parts of the problem we are disregarding, which means that at the very best, we're talking about a highly suboptimum uh, result. At the bottom, many things are stochastic. The weather is stochastic. It's not a test reference year from, from anywhere. It's not weather from you know 2018 and we use that and somehow that represents our system going forward it isn't like that we've also got occupant behavior we've also got equipment failure and gremlins and things that happen and they all have to be respected or we have to declare or the tool has to declare that something's been fixed no problem in doing fixed occupancy but that needs to be a caveat on the simulation results, that they are true if the occupancy is fixed. Of course, at X66, there's ways of simulating occupant behavior. Nonlinear uh, behavior of systems is well understood. The various domains have been expanding all the time, either within single modeling tools or by using a, a multiplicity of tools in cooperative mode. So however we do it, I think we can move simulation on to respect these integrities. Strap line at the bottom, if we oversimplify, we just degrade simulation to some um, conspired uh, calculation tool. It's misaligned, but with reality. Therefore, I have to ask, what are we talking about? If two engineers want to constrain models to compare the results, I have no problems. If legislation wants results against a prescribed boundary condition, I have no problems. But the general use of simulation can't follow that. It just means nothing is aligned with reality and nothing is comparable. And that cannot be right for our community. Just very quickly, there are some examples of system dynamics and nonlinearities. Every one of those items of plant have got variable uh, uh, efficiencies. And those efficiencies depend on the context of use. In fact, some of them, at some points in time, will be more than 100% efficient. They'll give out more energy than you put in because it's a dynamic problem. Everything's lagging and leading. And so it's not right to uh, simplify these things. These characteristics 
are the outputs from simulation tools, never the inputs. Of course, you can make them inputs, and you can do a little parametric investigation of what, how your energy system responds against different CO2 levels, uh, sorry, um, uh, COP levels. Of course, you can do that. But that's not you simulating reality, where the evaporator and condenser temperatures are changing as a function of weather or internal building load, and the COP is all over the place, and you're trying to do simulations to get control of that and develop a hybrid system. We need to make our tools fit for purpose. The material uh, graphs here are just showing the material behavior, conductivity and uh, permeability as a function of um, uh, state variables, uh, water content and temperature and so on, and relative humidity. And these are very important for getting aspects of health and well-being and making sure when we upgrade our housing stock in a cold climate and we put insulation in cavities, we don't end up with what's happened in the UK where they reckon up to 2 million homes will need to have their insulation taken out because of uh, problems with uh, hydrothermal behaviour and moisture and mould growth and so on. It's shocking. And our technology can help with this, but we would need to respect nonlinearity. So this is to remind me to say, for me, simulation, for me, and I know, I know not for others, and I respect my other colleagues' views, it's not my field and I can't talk about it, but for me, simulation is the same as, when we talk about simulation, for me, it's about talking about numerical methods and having the ability to take uh, complex buildings, complex HVAC plant, complex uh, um, uh, ventilation systems, uh, control systems, uh, electrical power systems, renewables, photovoltaics. Taking these things, maybe one of these is a heat pump, taking these things and knowing how to make them into discrete numerical equivalents. We live in a digital world now, so we need to take the, the continuous realities that we have and we need to have some understanding about how, what the equivalent discretized uh, equivalent is. And we need a lot more work in exposing to our industries how best to go about this to get adequate resolution in order to tackle different problems. It's not rocket science, but it's made difficult through our vocabularies and the way we can communicate these issues to each other. Over here, this is just about all the issues about how you uh, subdivide domains so you can look at fluid flow or mean age of air, uh, how you subdivide skies so you can look at uh, um, uh, radiation distribution or illuminance distribution um, and so on. So there are issues here and equally between these various domains that we need to discretize. There are interactions, and I'd like to be able to discuss with colleagues at IBIPSA forums and the, and the like what these domain interactions are and how we can either model them or turn them off by having good assumptions that we all understand so that we can say that domain's perfect, this is what we mean. But the domain's still there, it's just not modeled. So there's so many interesting issues underneath numerical modeling. Simulation, however, is, is absolutely more than calculation. I don't think in true simulation there is any role at all for simplified methods. We can impose simple, simplified methods on simulation and say we're doing that. That becomes a source term or some fixed condition to study something. But we're essentially saying once we discretize some complex system, we need to then form our conservation statements, which relate to all these processes. Now, we're pretty good at doing these things now. There's a way to go in some of them, but all of these ones here have been done for years and can be easily uh, uh, promoted further, uh, made more easy to understand. This one might not be as uh, uh, well understood for our profession, there's new ones coming along like contaminants. Um, clearly, things like CFD and mass and momentum are well understood by many, but they need to be popularized in our industry, so our designs take benefit from it. And there may be some other domains we want to add in. So 
But what we're really talking about in simulation is once we've discretized, how do we generate all the uh, balances that take account of our physical properties, the state variables of our problem? And all this says is we need to solve the whole conservation statement in some clever way as we march through time. And there's lots of ways of doing that. And all our codes, the big codes, are doing it in some way or another. And we need to get this out and understood by the industry. A strap line at the bottom is that no matter what we do in the future, it's hubristic, it's just outrageous exaggeration to say we can predict anything about the future. What we can do, and we can do it in a phenomenally good way and helpful way, is we can emulate reality so that when we put our designs into our virtual world, they get subject, they get buffered and subjected to the sorts of things that happen. And then we can observe that and say, that's a pretty robust solution. That's got inherent resilience. I'll discuss how this might be done a little later. Uh, I'm not going to go through these, only to say that you know, often people will say, well, what, what theory do we need to develop? Or what do we need to do? And I obviously don't have time to talk about anything theoretical here. But you can just, there's a big list, which you can look at later, and there's many other things that uh, PhD students can come along and help us get better, even things like solvers. We've got phenomenal solvers just now, but there's work to be done to make to give them and a, a part within them some intelligence to speed them up, to take account of some things we've not thought about. There's all sorts of things we can do in order to make the whole technology even more helpful, useful. But we need to deliver all our new theories in a manner that we can rapidly introduce them to existing or evolving tools. At the moment, when I read a journal paper, I don't know what to do with the theory that's given in there or the, or the new concepts. I can't use it, so it's not helpful. I can't just pick it up and just drop it into, with acknowledgments, into the systems we work with. And all my colleagues around the world would like to do the same, or a new system that's emerging. Surely we can find a way to uh, give our technologies, perhaps in the form of source code or um, compiled code or whatever, in a way that, uh, that, that can be useful. And I know there are uh, modeling, model making formalisms that help with this, but I'm, and, and I, I respect them, but I'm talking about the, the, the theory itself being made more conducive to picking up and installing rather than necessarily the software engineering construct we use to do that. My third topic is uh, the issue of application. And I believe BPS now is not realizing its potential because of this absence of know-how in relation to model making in the first hand. Everybody makes their own model. And frankly, I don't understand why or how or when or where they've made that model. And also this whole issue of multi-criteria, whole system performance appraisal, everything seems to be so partial. We only talk about, you know, uh, we've got to tick boxes about carbon emissions, or we um, uh, maybe we look at uh, glare, but we never get the balance. So it seems to me the resolution of this is for the community as all well to produce exemplar applications, make them available, that define best practice modeling in high resolution, high resolution modeling, so that the student body can pick these things up, copy them. Practitioners can go somewhere and get the high resolution exemplar nearest to their case and then adapt it. It could be parameterized to facilitate that. And we also need um, performance assessment, and the professional bodies need to do this to declare what constitutes a performance assessment for purpose one, a performance assessment for performance two, and these must be embodied in our tools. So the user doesn't have to define it, they just select performance assessment six, and we all know what that means. Here's an example on the left of a high resolution uh, house model, doesn't matter what systems used. And this model has got 3D geometry, it's got electrical networks activated. It's got heating systems. It's even got CFD domains in the combustion chamber of a 
condensing boiler, it's got a CFD model in the, in the spaces, it's got enhanced resolution at thermal bridges, it's got air movement, it's got renewables integrated, it's got all the furnishings, it's got all the material properties. That model's parameterized, so anyone could pick that model up and perhaps quite easily adapt it to their case so that they could look at a lot of really important issues without everybody having to invent their own models. On the right-hand side here, uh, national stock models. It's very possible, and it's been done. I'm not promoting anybody's work here. It's been done by several to generate large stock models, maybe comprising 80,000 uh, uh, 3D models, all generated automatically sitting in a stock database, which can be picked up and simulated to support um, action planning or um, all sorts of things, benchmarking. And if I had time, I could talk forever about how this is being used in various cities throughout the world. So these models can be used in design. They can be used in teaching contexts. So why do they not exist? Why do our tools not have exemplar models that we all, we've all agreed? If we did have, this is for housing. These are the outputs from such a model. These would be dynamic outputs, of course, changing across time. But you can look at glare and daylighting. You can look at thermal bridging and age of air. And you can look at power quality and community energy schemes. You can look at the combustion products coming out, the condensing boiler in this case. You can look at the control system dynamics. You can look at whether you're going to have air quality issues. These are really, really interesting outputs that are so well aligned with reality and helpful and they come from high-resolution models. We can do the same thing with commercial buildings. We can form a, a, a very detailed exemplar of a large commercial building with its occupants, with its control systems, with its HVAC systems, its lighting systems, its electrical network, its renewable energy. This is a real problem, but I'm, I'll not mention where. And all these networks are all activated. And then a model like that allows you to look at for example, the things I showed before for domestic, but in this case, searching through the model for well-being in terms of uh, standards for thermal uh, comfort, for visual comfort, for air quality, or whatever we want to look at. So the model comes back and says, I've, or the program comes back and says, I've checked your design and I've found it not very good in the following regards. The user doesn't need to direct that performance assessment. It's standard as long as the, the model that's delivered, the physical mo uh, the, the, the equivalent of the physical uh, uh, building and its systems is high resolution enough. And of course, in this approach, we can bring together all the different performance aspects because that's the real power of simulation when you use it to understand trade-offs. Nothing can be perfect. You can only hold things in balance and argue and defend your case why you think your integrated view is a good one and is better than some other proposal. And so we need to learn to, to, to present multi-criteria evidence against standard assessments. It's the only way the technology is going to deliver in the real world, in my humble opinion. More than that, however, I speak now to industry. The fact that modeling at this level gives you outputs which I call experiential. You can see the performance. These are snapshots. That enables us for the first time to communicate really quite complex issues to all stakeholders, whether it's a local authority, citizens, other practitioners from different disciplines, planners, legislators, all of that can be, and these are all real examples, really big cases in smart cities and so on, and smart grids, et cetera. And they're so useful for helping people understand what's happening, as opposed to uh, the, the, the traditional engineering thing where we talk about, you know, uh, so many kilowatt hours per square meter per annum or tons of CO2 mitigated or something like that, which frankly, I don't understand. It's also generally applicable. We can apply it to urban energy management. We can use simulation scenarios for the future, mix it with real data, 
and inform people about opportunities. Microgrid design, we can use simulation to reshape loads. We can use simulation to explore supplies and when we can see how that could be brought together. We can also use simulation to deliver new energy services or energy related services widely to society. We can look at smart street lighting, PV charging of EVs in urban environments. We can explore opportunities for action in cities. We can even apply exactly the same technology to other domains. This is exactly a building simulation tool being used to simulate a car. There is no difference. You can see here the HVAC plant is causing fog rather than avoiding it. It's the same technology when we're talking about simulation. We can also take our simulation tools and embed them inside other systems which are easier for people to use. So this is an interface to an entire national stock model, which is represented by simulation. So all the uh, designs can be taken out. You can ask questions about upgrades. And all the answers you get back are not little statistical methods or some steady state, but true simulation. It's equally possible to embed simulation in upgrade quality tools. So you upgrade a part of the city, and then you only sign off the upgrade if it comes close to, after a while, with uh, benchmarks that simulation has produced as the kind of carnal potential for the upgrade. So saying this is the maximum you could reach. And then these tools, which are in use in various places, now simulation-based quality assurance tools. This one uh, design uh, blends um, uh, tech policy constraints, all the different policy factors, with technical constraints produced by simulation to give areas of opportunity in cities for the deployment of things. Uh, big libraries of control systems, and you can select them, and then by simulation, you'll see how they perform in your particular case. You just give the loads in this case. Designing things, new systems like biomass heating systems, and so on. They can all be deepened by making them simulation-based. Regulatory tools can even be simulation-based, like in the UK, SAP and SBEM could be simulation-based. And that would be BRIAM and LEED. That would be a, a huge step forward, in my opinion. Second last topic, uh, I'll speed up a little, um, use in practice. So the functionality of this approach is very extensive, but it's not easy to apply in practice. So if we're going to utilize it in practice, clearly some of our companies, some of our businesses employ young graduates who've got these skills and they're fine. But the majority of small, medium-sized enterprises don't have that capability. So therefore they need to develop uh, different work practices. They need to understand and adopt a computational approach to design, which might be done in partnership with two SMEs together, or an SME with an academic partner, and that is beginning to happen in various parts of the world. I won't go through this, but it's just to say that there's so many little, as we describe our problem to the computer, we then get a reward of what, how that aspect of the problem works, and then we can move on to the next aspect. So this ability to uh, increase the depth of our description of the issues, be rewarded by some good experiential performance information, make some decisions, and then move on to some next topic as we go from the beginning to the end where we've got a good solution. And I have always argued and argue today that that approach is cheaper than the current way we design, it's better, and it's quicker. But you would need to change your work practice. And if you're so wedded to the way you do things just now, then you will not get the advantages of this technology. And perhaps there'll be some disruptive new SMEs will come out uh, delivering their designs through cloud services based on simulation technologies. And the companies that missed the, the, the bus or the airplane or the boat in this technology will regret it. In order to facilitate this, we need new CAD dialogues. I believe that CAD period of design should be the, the locus of control of this process. 
However, CAD does not define the superset data model. The data that CAD requires to produce pictures like the one in the screen from the excellent Bentley systems um, need a lot of data for that. But they're about material positioning, the geometry of it, the interactions, the constructions, the clasping, and all the rest. But in order to do what we're talking about here, we need context. Where are we? What's the price of uh, fuel? We need operational details that can be quite volatile. We need occupants moving around and doing things, etc. We need uh, the electrical power system interacting with the lighting system, which is interacting with the PV in the roof, which is interacting with the grid. This is a lot of information that's not currently in CAD. And we also need all the process models of simulation, getting the data returns, presenting them to users. So I think this phenomenal and really interesting CAD futures, where we go on a journey to extend the functionality of CAD by embedding BPS plus within the CAD environment so that those who design are using CAD interface, but they're getting better and more immediate access to BPS Plus. And of course, that started, and I'm not mentioning any tools. But to integrate within business, there's a whole lot of things that we also need to put in place, and some of these are happening. Again, I won't go through them all. I put them here so you can look at them later if you're interested. But we need to move program validation, make it an impartial activity. It cannot be done by the authors. Authors can validate their own codes. I have no pro problem with that whatsoever. It's a really good way to uh, evolve a prototype. But at the end of the day, when the tool is put out, it needs to go through some accreditation process, which the industry respects and controls. We need support for tool selection. We've got big databases that list all the tools, but they're promotional. The vendors and the authors promote their tools, and that's fine. Again, it's not impartial, so that we can give help for tool selection. User training needs to be standardized, and some of my colleagues around the world are working hard to do that. We must all recognize and find the mechanism to bring it together, um, and so on. Um, we uh, need to have a better model calibration, which I'll just touch on in a second. And other things we need in terms of when you get lots of outputs from a simulation. How do we judge the outcome? How do we know that that integrated view performance is good? So we need to have those discussions. And that gets us involved in disparate weightings and, and stuff. And also, one of my hobby horses is the fact that industry wants to pay vendors money to use proprietary code that they cannot see the source code. And whilst I have nothing against proprietary code, and I understand the business model there and respect that, the industry needs a blend where it can jump in to code, which is source code availability to look at issues, and then go back to the proprietary code, which maybe it trusts or there's a, a litigation model behind or whatever. We need to have more rapid code adaptation and intervention. So we need to resolve this open source proprietary dilemma that we have, which is blocking route to market of these ideas. Model calibration. There's a lot of good work going on in this and still going on. And that process is being, but we need to accelerate the process of calibrating models before use embedded in the tools themselves. Some tools do that but not all do. In fact, the majority don't. And there's no tool in the future that practitioners should accept that doesn't do a quick calibration against something before it uses the model you've given it. What would be the point of not calibrating? And since we can automate the process and even use field devices that are rapidly deployable to get some information from a smart meter or some environmental sensors, if it's an existing building case, in order to uh, calibrate the program, then why would that not be embedded? This is a, a, a big project in Europe called hit to gap and it's driving towards that, the ability to put lots of field devices into estates, to store all the information, and then to launch 
simulation-based services, which will exist in a cloud server. So already there are people, and these are commercial people behind platforms like this. So I'm not promoting it as a commercial thing. I'm involved in this as a researcher, but and there's, there's other uh, similar systems being developed in the States and in, in Korea, I know of a big one. But these um, uh, uh, platforms are going to start to systematically emerge. And we need to make sure that BPS Plus understands them and can transact with them. And for the youth that are listening in, that's all about JSON protocols and um, you know, cloud-based services and so on. Um, I'm just going to kind of miss this, uh, but if we wanted to support high integrity models, uh, modeling, there's a whole series of things that we could do. But I'm going to run out of time, so I'll move on. My last topic is uh, reality emulation. So simulation along the lines I'm talking about here, it provides us for the first time with a means to assure operational resilience and help us to understand performance across the scheme's life cycle. So I believe that we should now seriously promote that BPS, BPS Plus, uh, the purpose of it should be reality emulation, not calculation of something. You can use it for calculation of something, but we should be saying the real purpose is reality emulation. Oh, but you can degrade that and use it for some engineering prescribed calculation. Of course you can. Uh, what will be the temperatures uh, tomorrow under these overheating conditions? Or what will be the, et cetera. So how would we move towards this? Here's my final pitch to you all. At present, all BPS applications correspond to models and simulations that define their own universe. So you go in and you say, I think I'll divide the problem like this, and I'll, I think I'll have a CFD domain there, and I think I'll have, uh, you know, an airflow network over here, and and then I will, um, uh, I think I'll use these boundary conditions, and I'll put these prescribed occupancy patterns, and you do simulations, pr uh, produce your results, and outcomes are then rendered vague and incomparable. I can sit in any audience to not understand the real semantic behind some graphs and tables and charts I'm looking at, because I don't really understand the essence of what was done. So one goal could be to emulate reality, not predict it. So we don't need to produce predictions. We need to say that when I emulated reality, my scheme worked. Now let me say what that would might mean. Before I do, these one, two, three, four, five are my quite punchy statements on how this might work. It, whatever it is, and I'm going to show a picture of it in a second, would operate on the basis of proposals delivered as high resolution models. And these proposals would be the, uh, the virtual equivalent of the physical reality. So it would be 3D geometry, it'd be constructional distribution, it would be a notion of how the occupants would use it. No occupancy profiles, I might add, but just these are the occupants we're trying to serve. Uh, these are the control systems I'm going to put in. These, this is is the HVAC plant I've got. This is the electrical distribution I'm envisaging. These are the embedded or local renewables I'm going to work with. That is a statement of the physical reality. And that is in the head, the semantic is in the head of the designer or the researcher. They then submit that somehow and without any involvement from the user, it's simulated. The user doesn't even know what's simulating it doesn't know anything about the simulation. And that simulation that the, 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 the proposal is submitted to is automatically uh, uh, subjected to gremlins, things that can go wrong in the real world. It can get very hot, very cold. It can be sunny and windy. It can be sunny and, and no wind. Uh, a, a control device can break. Uh, the uh, the, the, the boiler can break down, the, the, the chiller can go offline for a while, etc. And so when we simulate through that with these gremlins activated, the outcomes are judged internally to the device against acceptable um, criteria which relate to models of users inside the, the, the testing environment. So we agree what these agents are. 
One might be an agent like a facilities manager. Another one could be uh, an office worker, uh, uh, etc. Another one could be, a, you know, a, an elderly person in a, in a house. And they decide if the environment is acceptable, not the tool user. So that would then facilitate the unambiguous comparison of alternative proposals in a way that was likely to lead to suggestions that would work in reality. We would close the gap between um, uh, performance intent and the actual performance that we measure, because we've subjected our idea to proper simulation with gremlins running and all the little um, agent models saying whether they're happy or not with it, all against the rules that we externally agree. That doesn't stop you using simulation in the conventional way, doesn't stop you degrading it, it's just a new way forward. So there's what the environment looks like. This is actually a funded project uh, which is underway, and, and all I'll say is it's in the UK, and SIBZ and RIS have agreed to take ownership of the outcome and try to take it to the industry. And I would love this kind of notion through Ibiza and Ashray and all around the world for this to become something like a new meme for building performance simulation. So quickly, we use CAD to um, uh, make our BIM model. In future, it will be totally BIMed. In the present time, it will be partially BIMed. That's then dropped into some environment. Imagine that's some cloud server. And the model is automatically calibrated, so it knows how to go and calibrate the model. That be, that's because the model itself can do its differential sensitivity, output that, uh, pairs uh, can, you know, uh, um, uh, uh, undertake some uh, principal components analysis, suggest parameter values, calibrate the model. Then perpetual annual simulations are commissioned, i.e. they never stop. You don't say simulate two months, a, a, a week or whatever. You just run forever simulations on that device, or on that uh, proposal. And you impose random, randomly, you impose stressors which are all agreed in advance by the community, the kinds of stressors that we would need to impose. Then automated tests, that's your occupant agents, are, are invoked at each point. Um, the process is suspended where performance is seen to be bad. The simulation doesn't stop, it is only suspended. And there's information given back to the interface that your design proposal will likely fail and you get the chance to consider why it would likely fail, maybe make a modification and substitute. Simulations perpetually running again until eventually you've got, uh, you've, you've passed at some level, in which case out you come and maybe in future that's your compliance certificate. These would be all the types of performance assessments that would be prescribed and installed within such an environment so that um, when you subject your design, you upload your design, you can ask for any of these to be uh, applied. And there's the thinking at the moment that for different sectors, domestic, non-domestic, community energy, active control, and so on, we would have different levels of tests. So what's happening in this project at the moment is the industry is being consulted to say what the, in, the, in, in an ideal world, what should be the performance assessment over lifetime? What should be the gremlins, things that go wrong? And what should be the sorts of things that would be deemed acceptable? In a house, I don't think it matters very much if it overheats now and again, because that would be expected for all sorts of reasons. However, if we're talking about a high quality passive house standard, then the criteria are more stringent. And it's quite possible to set these down in such a way that when you submit your design to the resilience testing environment, you then say what standard of test you want. I want an intermediate level. That means at conferences, people would show a design and say it has passed at intermediate level uh, domestic test. And we would all know what that meant. They wouldn't need to talk about boundary conditions or what, what, what um, assumptions they imposed on the model, we would know. And we'd be able to say, wow, that's pretty good. I couldn't get my design through that. It's the same test. And if I just go back one, 
Uh, this environment exists at the moment uh, is fairly easy to understand and construct, but it needs to be powered by our simulation tools. And in future, that could be any BPS plus, as long as it was approved. Not approved because it was valid, approved because the relationships between all the domains that are active are valid, so that the airflow is connected to the, um, you know, the mechanical ventilation systems and the light levels are connected to the photocells and the photocells to the, uh, to the lighting system, to the PV, and then you have to export it. As long as it's got the causal relationships well uh, um, activated, then it would be allowed to be a simulation program inside this environment. And I should just say, you would pass on attainment of a prescribed level of performance under standard stressors relating to equipment failure, power outages, abnormal weather, tariff changes, control system failure, and lots of externalities. And that's what's being designed at the moment, uh, consulted on at the moment. So to conclude, uh, um, uh, I think the whole concept of BPS Plus or BPS Futures has phenomenal potential. Uh, uh, it needs uh, the application scale to be increased, and that's really good news for our businesses that we in our domain, in our, in our field. The theoretical basis needs to be evolved towards emulating reality. That's really good for our young researchers, for targets. The application target should move from discrete performance calculation to holistic resilience testing. And there's so much that can be done now at the state of the art, and even more in the future that aligns well with the real problems we have in society. Unleashing the potential of all of this cannot be done by academic push. Never, never, never. It can only be done by industry pool. So unless we can get the industry structures in place to demand this as a potential for their businesses, it is not going to happen. But when we do create such a pool, we also need to make sure it's open and the industry isn't looking across their shoulder at each other, thinking that their competitor is going to get. We need to do this part of the problem in an open manner, but at the behest of the industry, because then the funding bodies will see our field as a legitimate R&D target and will fund. And the message we should give out to everyone in future, the message that I hear lots of people say now, if you can't simulate your proposal, don't build it because it won't work. So I don't know any way that the complexity underpinning all of this, if you don't, the very act of simulation helps you to understand where it might not work, where it will be resilient, where it needs improved. So that needs to be done in future. Now, I've got two further slides which I won't talk to, but just to say, if you go to the uh, journal paper which was written on behalf of the board of IBIPSA about the vision, then there you'll find 16 propositions in there uh, of uh, what IBIPSA will try to do to move um, the field on. And in many ways, I've aligned with these. Uh, I align with all of them. But what I've been talking about, you'll see, oh, that's proposition N. And something else I'm talking about, oh, that's proposition M. So um, uh, just to say that that's all quite well documented in the uh, uh, official BIPSA policy, the so-called BIPSA white paper. Uh, if some of the younger people who are listening in want to go and, and read that and think about it a bit more. I've overrun a little bit, but that's what I always do. My apologies. Um, I hope I've, that's in any small way uh, useful for you. And I'm just sorry I can't uh, uh, have a coffee with you now, but I'll take any questions you have. Over to you. Um, Rajan. Thank you very much, Joe. Uh, can you hear me properly? I can, yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, so far, we have a two question. Uh, one person has uh, requested me that I should read that question on his behalf or his or her behalf. Uh, the question is from Elayus D. D. Cruz. The question is that can we expect to see BPS plus evolution in ESPR. OK, uh, I am uh, very uh, nervous about uh, marketing anything that I'm personally involved with because, uh, and I'll tell you the real reason is, anything I'm involved with, I can see its merits, but I can also see all the problems and downsides. 
and I don't like to hype things up. But let me be truthful about ESPR. R stands for research code, and I've always resisted its commercialization. And I've always tried to indulge myself and my colleagues too in just looking at what BPS futures might be. And that's what BP at ESPR is all about, putting in things that might not even be easy to use at the present time. There's lots of things in it which violate my four principles. And one of the things I'm doing now is to make them uh, uh, overt so that when you use ESPR, anywhere one of the four principles are violated, it will say that that's the case. So uh, that's my only, until the day I leave this earth, I'm going to just keep trying to drive ESPR forward as an exemplar model of how all these things can be integrated. I'm aware that that's all then inside a big legacy code, Fortran 95 and some C in there. That doesn't worry me at all. And I'm aware that that functionality could be re-encapsulated in more modern software engineering paradigms. And I look forward to that day. However, let me be clear on something. I will not support any other software engineering paradigm unless I support it if it's, if it's researching the benefits of another paradigm. And I'm really interested in that. But I won't support the tool that emerges unless I can understand how it's evolved functionality. Because that really is the crying need at the moment to produce tools that deliver performance assessment functionality to our industry. Um, and although I'm very respectful and I've worked in the area myself of software engineering, uh, I think it's that functionality. So myself with my colleagues, I always push them now for functionality. I don't care what language it's written in. Some of them are all Python freaks now, but the functionality needs to be improved. So what's the new thing? And when we put out successive releases of ESPR, all you will get is new functionality. And if you can join us in that, it's all open. You can own it. You can sell it. You can make money on it. And I don't want to destroy my industry. So I'd like to bridge the gap between that open nature and the proprietorial codes, which I understand are good business models, but may have to change in future as we go to service-oriented cloud computing and all the rest. So I hope that's the answer. Uh, anything I say, all of this, it will be encapsulated in ESPR because that's how we research it. Thank I hope you. That's uh, I'm sorry, I forgot the question's name. I hope that was a reasonable answer. Yeah, and the person is responding over uh, what text is saying, excellent. So thank you, Joe. Uh, and I, ha I have uh, there's one more person who wants to ask a question. I have unmuted that person, Anthony Paleshi. Uh, Anthony, if you can hear me, uh, can you just uh, ask a question directly to Joe? Yeah, can you hear me, Joe? Yes, I can. Hi, hi. Great. Thanks a lot. I I work in Canada for a consulting firm that does um, energy modeling support for a lot of projects, um, and and I I really hear what you're saying about BPS Plus. We I feel like my colleagues and I want what you're saying to be kind of the future of the industry. We we work on a lot of projects. You know, we work on a number of guarantee performance projects, and I always struggle to explain to um, the you know the developers that well a model isn't meant to predict the actual performance it's meant to help you make decisions and to to design a robust system but i feel like a lot of the there's a lot of momentum now and you know rightly so um to use it to predict and also i feel like the cost like the consulting time needed to develop the the more robust uh, bps plus kinds of visualizations and and design support and that the, the the sophistication of the modeler and their experience is quite high. And so I worry that people aren't going to be willing to pay for and or ask for um, BPS plus because they're still going to want old BPS for one reason or another. And I just wonder if you could speak to that sort of the cost to, tr to change the industry. Like I agree with you that it needs to change, but I'm nervous about how it relates to, to the current expectation. So. Sure. Well, it'd be very, very silly, I think, to try to adopt a new technology and throw out the old technology. So this will be a transition that might take some while. Um, as a researcher, I don't, I can think in long-term horizons, so it doesn't really worry me. Uh, but so, so companies, of course, if they're using BPS uh, and there's certain on costs in that, 
and then they, they see this new technology coming out, they might want to experiment a little and see if it's in what way it, it provides an improvement. However, let me say clearly, in order for this to work, you're absolutely right. It must take the pressure and the cost away from where it is at the moment. I don't see anyone in future sitting there trying to make these high resolution outputs. They should be automated. They should come just when you buy the tool. I don't see anyone sitting there coordinating simulations. I see a company like yours maybe doing it because that's the service you're operate, offering. But the majority of people will do no more than in future than define what it is they're thinking about, which only they can do, and then simply drop it into an evaluation environment. And they won't do any of the things that they currently do with BPS. Um, and that's the vision for the future. That will be ultra cheap. It will be quick. It won't require any. And that will, that's the way to democratize the whole technology because it just becomes easy to do. So we have a company just now who we've given the resilience testing environment, we call. And they're doing the conventional, they pay money for proprietary codes and so on. And they've got a team who work with systems to existing tools and all the issues you're talking about. And they are um, uh, uh, matching what they do. So they've got one individual who will take the same model that they're building anyway and drop it into the resilience testing environment. And then they're trying to say, would that be the way forward? They get back uh, only they've passed. You're passing this test. You failed that test for these reasons, rather than using simulation in the conventional way. And I could see companies like you, yours, evolving to being the, that kind of service provider. And that's probably what the industry needs. So not everybody needs to use computational tools, but they can all get access, get the benefit from it. But unless we uh, tackle what you've just said, the, the time constraints of practice and the financial constraints, I'll say just one last thing, uh, and that is, even if there are existing time constraints and financial uh, constraints, if these are significant, it's not hard to demonstrate to people that what they're doing with significant time and cost constraints is pretty awful. And that the new approach, although it's time and cost constrained as well, is actually going to move as nearer to systems that work. And the way to do that is to tackle it from the legislative end, you know, to get the legislators to say that uh, resilience testing and uh, you know, pass or fail tests against agreed standard in the industry, which is underpinned by simulation, that would be the breakthrough. And it's the one I'm pushing for, because then we would all do it that way. But you're dead right, it's expensive and it's time consuming at the moment. I'll just stop there. Yeah, uh, thank you. I think uh, Anthony is saying that that's a great answer. Uh, so thank you, Joe. This is a great uh, uh, opportunity and a great webinar. And thanks for inaugurating the second webinar series of 2019. And uh, over the year, we will offer another 11 uh, episodes to the, uh, to the member. Thank you, Joe, for spending time and offering the webinar. Thank you very much. You're doing a good job. Keep it up. Speak to you all later, guys. Please uh, uh, come up to me at, at the conference if you're there and we'll have a chat further. Bye-bye, everyone. Yeah. Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining. I again request you to visit uh, Ibipsa website and join Ibipsa as a supporting member. Ibipsa needs your support. Thank you very much.